All right. Thank you so much for coming to this panel session and to our symposium. We are absolutely excited to have you here. Uh, we have a great panel session right now, and we have another panel session coming up during lunch. So uh, for the next hour or so, we will be talking with a couple of UCSB alumni who have been zoomed in, who you guys can see up on the screen. We have Esther Trujillo and Molly Metz, and they are alums from here who have been teaching for the past few years. Um, and so they're going to talk to us about their experiences. And we also have UCSB Almost alums. They're very close. Uh, Hannah Wolf and David Stamps. And they have um, been on the job market for the past year and have both secured jobs. And so we're going to be asking them questions about that. Which is very exciting. Um, let me make sure that I've got all kind of the ground rules here. This afternoon, um, during lunch, the faculty members who we have invited to give presentations and to join us for the panel will be talking about uh, what it's like to, what people who are on hiring committees will be looking for. And so think about that as you think of questions that you want to ask the two panels. This panel is about how did you get a job? What's it like going out for interviews? All those kinds of things. And the afternoon one is more about what are faculty on hiring committees looking for? What, what is their perspective? All right. So um, I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves in just a minute. Uh, after those introductions, we have a few questions that people have sent in. Uh, during this week, uh, and so we're going to be asking the panel those, set, those questions just to get started. And then after that, uh, we're actually going to <coughs> allow David and Hannah to ask some super secret questions <laughs> from, for, of Esther and Molly. I feel like we've hyped this up too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then after that, we will uh, allow time for you guys to ask questions. And so we expect, we expect you to have between 20 and 30 minutes to ask questions. So please get your questions ready. Uh, we want to hear from you. And um, I will be moderating this panel along with Katie Bainbridge up here. So we will be passing the mic around to you when it's your turn, all right? So if you have something to say, just raise your hands. Um, I want to thank the panelists very much for being here today. Uh, they are, we're just so happy that they have ex accepted to come and tell you about their experiences. Uh, we're go I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And I'd actually like to start um, with Molly, if that's all right. So Molly Metz, um, Welcome to the panel, and will you please introduce yourself, and can you tell us a little bit about your experience over the last few years and your, your job, your career experience? I can do that. Hi, I am Molly Metz. I graduated UCSB um, in 2015 from Psychological and Brain Sciences. I'm a social psychologist. Um, and I also completed the C-cut because I knew pretty early that I wanted to do a teaching focus position. Um, immediately following uh, UCSB, I was in a visiting assistant professorship position at Miami University for two years. Um, that was an annually renewed contract. I had an amazing experience there, uh, but I didn't know for sure until March of each year if I would have a job the next year. So I had to basically be on the market each year. So I was looking for something with more stability. Uh, currently, I am at the University of Toronto in um, downtown Toronto. Um, I just finished up my second year and my position here is um, I'm an assistant professor teaching stream. Um, so what that means is I have security of employment. I go up for a uh, continuing status in much the same way that a tenure track position goes up for tenure. Uh, we just call it something different because my position here is not based on research at all. So my evaluation is 80% teaching, 20% service. Um, so I'm finishing up my second year here. I'll have my third year review next year and hopefully uh, be here for the long haul. Is there anything else, Mindy, that you'd like me to touch on now? Sorry, I was just trying to get the mic back on. Sorry. No worries. 
All right, Esther, if we can go to you next. Um, you have been in your position for about two years, right? Right, yeah. I'm finishing my second year um, as an assistant professor in the Department of Latin American and Latino Studies at DePaul University in Chicago. I graduated from UCSB in 2017 uh, with a PhD in Chicana and Chicano Studies. Um, <clears throat> I was hired um, while I was finishing my dissertation. And so um, one of the things that I learned later was that one of the biggest discussions at my hiring um, conversation was whether I was going to be actually done in time and have filed in time. Um, and when I got here, folks told me that in the past they had had people who came without filing and that that was very difficult um, on the department and on resources, um, <clears throat> mostly because it has to do with how much folks get paid. If you have not filed, they can't pay you what they want to pay you. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that I was done, that I didn't have any anything connecting me still with UC Santa Barbara in the sense of being unfinished. Um, so my uh, contract is, is tenure track. I go up for tenure um, in the fall of 2022. Um, and my evaluation is based on equal parts research and teaching with a very small portion of, of service. So our handbook doesn't have the breakdown officially, but the chatter is that it's something like 40, 40, 20, um, which I think is, is very dif different from Molly's situation. Um, DePaul is primarily a commuter school, a teaching institution, but we are classified as an R3 on the research category. So there's R1, R2, R3, um, which means that they do expect uh, research productivity from us, but they also expect an excellent standard of teaching. And I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to do both, right? <laughs> Thank you. Um, now I would like to give a chance to uh, David and Hannah to introduce themselves. Uh, Hannah, you're going to be finishing your degree in a few months. <coughs> David, I think you too, right? Um, can you, <laughs> crossing your fingers, is that what you're doing? Um, <laughs> will you uh, please, David, why don't you start? Tell us a little bit about your job search and where you're going to be going and uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm David, a uh, PhD candidate in the Department of Communication. I will be heading to LSU in Baton Rouge, Louisiana as a tenure track assistant professor. Um, I focus on media psychology, uh, but I also do a lot of work in race and strategic communication. And so I'll be teaching a, a mixture of those courses. Um, I, I forgot the rest of it. Oh, about the, the job process. So um, interestingly, I sat where you were sitting a year ago and there was something that was said here at this panel that kind of refocused how I was going to go on the job market. And so I went on the job market in July. Um, and interestingly, I applied for my LSU position on August 12th. I had my Skype interview before the school year started, and I got an on-campus interview the Friday of week zero. So LSU was not joking. So I had a job in October. Um, and that was because on this panel, someone who took an assist, a visiting assistant professor position said, I went on the job market in December. I got this job, but they hired a tenure track assistant professor in that department that I was more than qualified for two months prior. And so she waited too late. And so it was in, in the chair you're sitting in right now where I said, well, I'm going to go on the job market ASAP because I don't want to miss anything. And it turns out that LSU specifically wanted to hire someone before our national annual conference, which is kind of the big come all, everyone's fighting for jobs. And they were like, we're not doing that this year. We want to hire someone before we even get to October. And so I accepted my job on October 27th. Out of curiosity, uh, did you apply to other positions? Oh my God, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I went on the, I, I started, when I say I went on the job market in July, I started looking at jobs, putting together my materials and applying. And so altogether I applied to 63 jobs. Um, LSU was like number nine. So I had already applied to eight other jobs before August 12th. Um, and I ended up in all honesty uh, with 17 Skype interviews and seven on-campus interviews. 
So I casted a wide net and it was, it was a good thing. Um, and I was done literally with by week four of winter, of fall quarter, I was done. I was off the job market focusing on my dissertation. So, but yeah, I cast a really, really wide net. Great. Thank you. Hannah, can you kind of do the same thing? Tell us about your job search. Yeah, um, my name is Hannah Wolf. I'm in the Media Arts and Technology program. So my job search was a little, I guess I'd say, the positions I was applying for were a little uh, wider range than a more specific traditional uh, discipline. I am going to be an assistant professor of computer science at Colby College this fall, uh, tenure track which is a small liberal arts college, which is, I think, kind of a different type of school than these other schools. My job, um, I, was, I started applying in October. I, I mean, I was looking at jobs, but my first applications I was submitting, it was in October. I learned that in computer science, uh, a lot of the research positions start, or research schools start, um, interviewing in January. So all these small liberal arts colleges wanted to get someone hired before January so they didn't have to compete with research universities. So I think this is like teaching positions may be earlier than research positions. Um, and I was applying to positions both in media arts and technology programs, any position that I could find, and then small liberal arts uh, CS positions. Um, I applied to, I think, about 24 schools. Uh, in the end, I had five on-sites and two offers out of those on-sites. So the third one, there was a third on-site that I actually, after I, I went on the interview and then I was like, actually, I'm taking this other position. Like I started negotiating and then I was like, mm. um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then I had like, I don't know, two on-sites that I canceled because I took a position. Great, thank you. Okay, I've got a few questions so, um, that have been previously submitted. So I'm gonna start with questions to Esther and Molly. Uh, and the first one is, um, if I can start with Esther. What are your responsibilities as a new professor? Um, you've talked about this a little bit. I'd like you to go a little bit more into what those responsibilities actually mean. Um, and then, uh, Molly, if you can take over from there. And just very briefly, you know, 30 seconds to one minute each. Thanks. Sure. So, um, <clears throat> here at DePaul, our teaching load is 333 by a quarter. Um, can, we get. Can a, you just explain what 333 is, just for people who. Yeah, are, that's three courses per quarter. So you'll hear people talk about things like 444, 2244, and it's, you know, if you see, if you hear three numbers, it's quarters. If you hear two, it's semesters. Um, but that's how many courses you're expected to teach. So our course load is three per quarter, and we get one release um, for service and two for research for the year. That means that we end up teaching two courses every quarter. Um, and that we're expected to contribute to those two other areas of the university. In my two years at DePaul, I've served on four committees. One is university level and the others are within my department. Um, my, so my service is committees and also programming. I'm responsible for bringing in speakers to the university that are connected to my courses. Um, and making sure that all of their travel arrangements, that there's somebody to introduce them when they talk, all of, of that type of hospitality business is part of my service. In terms of teaching, um, I've repeated the same courses that I taught in the first year, in the second year, and I just received my schedule for next year. It looks like I'll be repeating again. And I'm grateful for that because it means that I don't have to prepare new courses. Um, again, and that's very time consuming. Um, research support at DePaul has been relatively small, but there is some available on a competitive basis. Um, and so is, is that kind of what you're looking for us to say? Okay. Thank you. Molly, if you'll go ahead. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned before, I'm teaching stream in a research heavy department. 
Um, so my teaching load is a 3-4. Um, we are arguing uh, to bring it down to a 3-3 three, three because we are still expected to contribute meaningfully to um, not necessarily research specifically, but other types of um, professional development, educational leadership, and these all mean slightly different things. Um, so my the courses that I teach are a combination of the um, giant statistics courses, so 200 person uh, stats courses, along with um, smaller upper level uh, content courses um, that are 50 people. Um, I have had enough repeats that I haven't, that the most I've had to prep per term is two classes, um, which two classes, two brand new classes a term, I would say is the uh, maximum that I would ever hope to have to do. Um, for service, uh, at the beginning of each year, I get a letter telling me what my specified service commitment is for the year. Um, so my biggest contribution since I've been here has been to the undergraduate curriculum committee. Um, we've been specifying program level learning outcomes that the government has started to require in order to get provincial funding. Um, and so uh, figuring out what our learning outcomes are, and now we're starting to do a curriculum mapping process uh, which I had no idea what any of these words meant about three years ago. <laughs> so it's a, it's a learning process. Um, I've also served on one uh, uh, hiring committee um, for a temporary level teaching position. Um, so that's been my service requirement so far. Um, in addition to my full course load, I have been supervising independent study students, um, which is not formally part of my requirement, but normatively expected of me. Um, so I've been supervising independent study students, um, doing some of my own research, um, presenting at conferences uh, and so on. So still a little bit of the same old uh, research stuff that I was trained to do as well. Great, thank you. Um, before I get into the questions that are specific for David and Hannah, I would like to give the two of you a chance to ask your questions to Esther and Molly about being a new professor. Um, so I just have, a, I guess, a general question. Um, what do you wish you had known when you were in my position that you've learned now with the, your years of wisdom as assistant professors? <laughs> So I have a slightly different answer to the question. Not what I wish I had known, but my best piece of advice for you, um, because there is so much um, department specific, university specific, domain discipline specific stuff, right? So even just listening to everyone talking about their job market experiences, I would say that psychology was totally different than comm and computer science. Um, and so there's so much domain specific stuff that I, I don't think a general answer would satisfy. Um, but my best piece of advice is to find um, the administrative person in your department who knows everything and make them your best friend. Um, both my job at Miami and my job here at U of T, I, a lot of the first term and first year is just figuring out the norms. Um, what are the accommodations? How do things get scheduled? Who do you refer students to in the case of all these issues? Um, and the universities vary widely in how easily uh, you can find this information online and how clear their expectations are. And so I would not have survived either of my jobs if it weren't for the amazing office administrative staff um, directing me toward the resources and knowing who to bug with all my different questions. So find that person and make them your best friend. So my advice is similar, but looking at the other direction of the administrative ladder, um, one of the pieces of advice I received when I started was every quarter, the dean of the college will call a meeting. Whatever you're doing, stop and go to the meeting. When you go to the meeting, multiple things will happen. One, the dean will see you're there, and the dean is the person who hired you. So you want your boss's boss to know and see and recognize your face throughout the years. Um, but two, you'll also get a sense of what the college, um, what the college's priorities are for the given moment, based on the discussion that occurs in that room. So everything from the agenda to the meeting will tell you, you know, everybody's really concerned about enrollments this year. 
or everybody's concerned about potential layoffs or consolidation of departments. And so if you don't go to those, it's very difficult to know kind of what, what the conversations are and, and where your program stands, where you stand, you know, as a new hire. Um, and so I would look at the administrative level and see where you can get face time with them and, and listen. Less talking, more listening. Okay, so my question, maybe slightly uh, related, was what was something unexpected about your position or institution? Like something that you, that it was actually really important to know when you came into the position, but you didn't learn until you got there? Well, Paul is a commuter campus. And I had some sense of what that meant, but I had not experienced that because I went to UCs for college and grad school. When I got here, I realized that most of the students spend a really long time getting to the campus. When they arrive, um, they have certain expectations about what their instructors will provide for them. They expect excellence. They show up very prepared. Um, and they also, because it's a private Catholic school, they expect a lot of individual attention. Um, not that UCSB doesn't give students a lot of individual attention, but the expectation from the students in terms of what, instruction, what, what instructors were responsible for towards them um, was something that I, I hadn't experienced with this intensity before. And I really love it actually, because it makes me feel more accountable to them they come to learn, and that's really exciting. That's a really tough question. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that one of the hardest things or surprising things, I guess, for me at this job, at this institution, is um, because of the reputation of U of T, um, you know, regularly on top universities worldwide, as well as in Canada, um, there are expectations about the grade distribution um, that are some explicit and some not explicit. Um, some are in the handbook, some are word of mouth, um, but, one of the biggest challenges uh, for me here, even more so than going to Miami from UCSB, is just adjusting to an entirely different set of expectations in terms of assessment. Um, I, so we basically, U of T is, you know, take the top 10% of all of their high school classes, put them in one place, and then tell them only 30% of them can get A's. Um, so I would say a lot of our jobs as teachers is like, a third anxiety management on top of um, content delivery and skill building. And I think that's even more so here. Um, and then there's just all kinds of weird institution specific things like at U of T, 80% and above is an A. Um, and still only 30% of people are expecting to get A's. Um, and so just recalibrating my assessments constantly and figuring out what this new distribution looks like has been a challenge that a few years ago, I would not have expected, right? My focus was on my specific courses and developing cool projects and prepping lectures and things like that. Um, but this is kind of a bigger picture issue that I didn't realize uh, was going to be such a big part of my job. Thank you very much. Those were really great. Um, all right. I have one or two specific questions for Hannah and David that came in this week. And so we'll ask those. And then after that, it's going to be your turn. So get, get ready. Um, all right, um, Hannah and David, and you can take this question in whichever order you want. What do you think made you stand out from other applicants? <laughs> um, do you want to take you can, it? You can go. Okay. Um, well, I, I don't know if this is true or not. <laughs> um, so I put everything out there. 
So in my cover letter, in my teaching statement, in my diversity statement, in my research statement, I was really unapologetic. So I study, um, I teach, I engage in pedagogy that is for, about, and by underrepresented groups. I bring those who are in the margins to the center. I take those who are oppressed and give them agency. And I made that conscious decision when I went on the job market. So that if the institution didn't value that, they shouldn't bring me in. And then when I went to visit that campus, I was extra black. Just so because because I'm a, I'm a token. I look good on a brochure. I look good on a website. But if you don't want me, I need you to to really reconcile that. And um and so. On a lot of my Skype interviews, and then a lot of my, um, especially on the on-campus interview, because it's three days long, and it's 12 hours long, and people get real after a while. Like, everyone's like, I can only perform for like the first five hours. <laughs> and so you, I would get faculty and deans and chairs say, you know what? You're really passionate. There was a way of saying like, you're really black. Like, and I got it. Like, I wanted them to know that. So that if you, because I, I got four job <laughs> offers, and three out of four were very much like, we need someone like you. Basically, we need a diversity hire. And I didn't take those jobs um, because I knew there was no one black on their faculty. I did my research. I knew there was, I could count the number of black faculty at some of the institutions all together and still have fingers left over. And so I stood out in my materials by being very unapologetic. And then when I, went on the, when I had the Skype interview and then if it worked out, the on-campus interview, I was very much like, this is what I do, this is what I bring, and I know there's very few people like me, but I am not here to be your token. And so it was a conscious decision that I talked over with my advisor and with Robbie Nadler, if you guys met him this morning, and they were all like, oh, let's see what happens, because that's not really how we're trained up. Be, be that perfect fit for the institution. Change and shift yourself and accommodate them. And I was like, no, because this is the rest of my life. Like, I want to get tenure and be planted. I'm older, so I'm, I'm not trying to, like, keep switching schools. Um, and so I know for a fact I stood out because just my face, I'm, I'm not, I'm the only black person in the room besides Charlene. So, like, so I'm usually the only one of the few people that stands out, but I also make sure my materials and when I engage, I was like, this is who I am. And you probably won't encounter most people like that, but if you don't value that, then we should part ways. Um, I think... For me, I guess sort of I would say that I kind of have a similar situation that like I'm a me I study media arts and technology, which is very rare. Like it's not a it's a kind of up and coming field, but it's not something that really exists in many places. So I really pushed that. Like when I went to look at art positions, I would be like, you know, I am also a computer scientist, and like you need to know that, and you need to. Um, like, s like value both the arts and the computer science side of my work. Um, and then when I went to the computer science institutions, I kind of pushed the, I'm interested in looking at different ways of engaging people in um, computer science. I'm interested in how can we use the arts to teach and promote computer science. And I think, again, as a woman, as someone in the arts, that brought a very um, kind of different portfolio and different person than a lot of other applicants. And again, computer science, there aren't that many women. Women are underrepresented. And I was looking at these small liberal arts colleges, which are also focused on individual-based learning, project-based learning. Um, being as like diverse and progressive as possible. So, you know, having me was, was helpful as well. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, I think, yep. I was going, there's one more question about advice, but I think that already went with Molly and Esther. So I'm going to pass it off to Katie and she's going to bring it around. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate the advice on what you wish you had known before you start teaching. Um, I'd like to open that up. What advice, what do you wish you had known before you started applying for jobs and going on the job market? So I can, I have words, sorry. I have a response to that, which is 
my experience was very, very, very different than David's. Um, I started applying in September. I did not even get my first email. We're interested in talking to you on the phone until the end of January. Um, I, so this is my first time on the market when I was still in grad school. Um, I had five campus visits and all of them did not turn into offers. And the ones I followed up on, it was clear it was because I was ABD um, and didn't have a degree in hand. Um, when I did ask for feedback, they said, uh, you're awesome. We just have all someone who's also awesome and has a PhD. So, um, but I then didn't get any offers. And there was about a two week period where I did not have anything else. And the Miami job was posted. So I had like two weeks of existential despair, not knowing what I was going to be doing <laughs> next year. Um, the gra the job application process in most fields is far less regulated than like graduate applications. So for a lot of graduate programs, you have to have your submissions in by a certain time, offers have to be released by a certain time, um, and there's not that kind of standardization um, in job applications. And so like endurance and patience and distraction, <laughs> uh, getting yourself through all of that really is uh, the name of the game. Um, I would also say, you know, check with people in your field or the field that you're applying for jobs in about what the norms are. Um, Hannah mentioned that the teaching positions seem to come out first and then research, whereas in psych, my experience was the complete opposite, that research positions tended to be earlier, then teaching, then temporary. Um, and so I was still applying for new positions in March and April. So I have no idea what the norm is in your field, but talk to someone who will. Yeah, I want to second that, but also add that if you um, if you are not sure what discipline you should apply to, I was interdisciplinary, and so my research training is in sociology, but my degree is in ethnic studies, essentially. Um, many of them have different time periods. The sociology job market is open much earlier than ethnic studies, which is open longer. Um, and so if you don't know that, you'll miss out on the entire hiring season potentially. So make sure that you don't miss out. Can I throw something in there real quick? Um, and I think this is one of the questions that was asked like prior to today. When you leave here today, you should join at join and hireed.org. And you should start looking at the jobs that come out right now in your discipline, because you can go in there and tailor to who you are. And so you can like start now and then as they come into your inbox, click on them if you have a second, follow them away if you don't, because they kind of give you a sense of what your program looks like and what the cycle looks like. So right now in communication, a lot of visiting and adjuncts uh, and postdocs are coming out now in April. Mm -hmm. And so our cycle arguably is very different than the other cycles, but you only know that if you start to engage. So right now you have nothing to lose, so just see what's happening. And then that way you know, do I need to go early? Am I gonna have a little bit more time? What does that look like? So you can actually engage now to get a sense of what your department, your discipline looks like. I, I think another thing on the just general job application is just put together your materials and start submitting. Like don't wait until you have the perfect teaching statement or the perfect research statement. Just <clears throat> getting yourself out there and getting feedback is really helpful and you can always modify your teaching statement or your research statement or your cover letter as you apply to more and more schools. Um, Mindy, if it's okay, I do wanna just follow up on one other thing, which is this, this notion of feedback. Um, most of the job market, there's not a lot of feedback. You send out a bunch and don't hear from most of them. Um, but one of the most valuable things that I did, both in terms of um, interviews that didn't turn into jobs, and then also once I got the job, once I got there, is asking why, um, right? You, when you are, when you have a phone interview that doesn't turn into a campus interview, you can totally respectfully say, thank you so much for your feedback. As I'm still on the market, is there any feedback you can give me as to, you know, what it was that, um, you know, didn't turn the interview into a campus visit or why I didn't get the job? Um, and that can be really helpful either in terms of shaping your um, strategy for the next jobs. Um, when you get the job and you say, why did I get it? You can make sure you do the things that are the reason they hired you. Um, but I feel like 
we don't ask for this type of feedback enough and it's often not institutionalized. And so as long as you're respectful about it, it is totally your right and really useful information. Again, Molly, uh, thank you very much for being there. I have a question for you specifically, which is you're in a very unique situation of a teaching stream, 80%, 20%. So in a major university which you're in, First of all, politically, how does that work with people who are doing publishing? How does that feel for you? Mm -hmm. And is it important for you still to do research? And will that be respected just to keep you current and so forth? So it's this whole thing, how do you deal with research in your position, which is very unique? Mm -hmm. That is a great question. And I have way more things to say than I have time to say it. Um, this is something that varies majorly. Um, Honestly, at UCSB, I was not impressed with the way that teaching faculty lecturers at the UCs were treated. Um, this also varies a lot by department. And so I assumed I was going into a small liberal arts school. Um, and it was my job at Miami and seeing how well the lecturers were integrated into the department, how respected they were, um, how they really felt like they were part of the team that I started thinking maybe I could do something like that. I don't think I would have the job that I have now if I hadn't had the job at Miami. I never would have applied to a position like this. Um, so at U of T, in my department, I feel very supported, very appreciated, and very lucky. Um, I know that not all departments feel the same way. Um, over the So this shift from lecturers to assistant professor teaching stream, happened at the university level um, maybe six or seven years ago. It's still relatively new. Our department just went through the first promotion from assistant to associate teaching stream. So it, we're still figuring it all out. Um, in my department though, I feel valued. I feel supported. Um, we have a lab. Um, there are three teaching stream colleagues and we have a lab space that we share in order to run our own research. Um, the expectation is that the research that we do is more pedagogical in nature than domain specific. Um, so like while I'm still a social psychologist and I'm still interested in relationships topics, um, my research is more on pedagogy. Um, but I know from conversations with my chair that if I wanted to do relationships research, that is also still supported. Um, the resources that I have are slightly different. The time that I have is slightly different. Um, but they recognize that staying current in the field is part of being an effective instructor. And so I go to teaching conferences, but I also still go to social site conferences and things like that. So in my situation, I feel supported um, to do the things that are most meaningful to me professionally that still contribute to the department. Hi. <laughs> um, I know uh, Dr. Metz and Dr. Trujillo, you brought up uh, like service requirements at your jobs, and I don't know if you two have similar things. Um, but maybe what did you, or did you do anything at UCSB that's related to that, or is that brought up in interviews at all? I can start. So I've, I've done a great deal of service here at UCSB. I was GSA president last year. I was black grad student president the year before. I've served on four external hiring committees, um, so not in communication department. All of that's on my CV, no one asks about it. And I, I interviewed at an R1, a two teaching, like on campus interviews at an R1, two teaching and one liberal arts, no one asked. And not to disappoint any of you, no one asked about my dissertation. They said, you think you'd be done in time? Yeah, great, next. It didn't come up, the service, and it didn't come up what my dissertation was even about, which was interesting because everyone said, you, you're going to talk about your diss. Your diss is your job talk. And I'm like, I'm not even interested in my diss. I just want to get it done for you. I had more work that I was really proud of that spoke to me, and that's what I took to my job talk. So it never came up. And to be honest, and I learned that here last year, um, my service was like on page seven. So I don't even know if they ever got to it. Um, <laughs> but I did a lot of service, and I'm very proud of but I, I didn't discuss it with any of the four on campus institutions and none, I can't even recall if it was on the Skype interviews, the service I did and what that was like. I would say that I had the opposite experience. Like I talked about, I, well, 
I was on KCSB radio, and I was specifically on the uh, Public Affairs Cultural Arts Committee, and we were looking for how do we add diversity into um, the radio station? How do we get more interesting and diverse voices in these categories? And I had that in my cover letter. Um, I talked about, I, I had people ask about my radio show. Like, I actually had faculty in interviews be like, so tell me about this radio show. Are you interested in continuing it afterwards? Uh, <laughs> uh, I talked about, um, oh, I did, I did say, like, I had been on hiring committees as well here at UCSB uh, Internal, and that didn't come up. I, um, I had done a lot of work in the community at Dos Pueblos High School um, with computer science education and the arts. And while I don't think that never came up, actually it did come up because there was a dean who said Dos Pueblos High School, um, that's Spanish. Um, what was your experience with working with Latino students? <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, maybe I put that in the wrong way. Sorry. Um, he. <laughs> uh, so, so the school I was interviewing at was a Hispanic-serving institution. UCSB is a Hispanic-serving institution. Dos Pueblos High School has a high Latino population. So he was so maybe maybe I put that in the wrong way, but he was asking like, you have this experience. This is something that we're interested in at our school because we have a similar population. Please um, talk about, you know, working with these, this certain group of people. <laughs> um, and I also did talk about my, I mean, maybe not my dissertation, but I talked about my research and my research is aligned with my dissertation. And there was a lot about like, well, what are you doing? What will you be doing next? And that came up a lot in mm -hmm. my interviews. I'll say, I did a ton of service um, at UCSB, so I was the CCUT fellow for two or three years, I don't remember now. Um, I also was on the TA training panel in psych, and so I was the lead TA, um, so I did a lot of the TA training related things as well. Um, and that was a substantial portion of my cover letter because service is really meaningful service is really important to me. Not all service is meaningful, um, but meaningful service is really important to me um, to the extent that like, if you care about your community, you care about making it better. Um, and so I was very explicit about that and that these are things that I value. Um, I would say that what type of service are you interested in didn't come up in interviews or things like that, but I do think it contributed to um, communicating the kind of faculty member that I wanna be. Um, and to that end, you know, when I asked my current chair, why did I get this job? Um, they said that one of the things that was really clear is that I wasn't just like a researcher applying to everything and a teaching job is what I got. It was very clear that a teaching position is what I wanted and that I had been training for and that I had been seeking out experiences in. And for me, my service at UCSB was part of that. Um, communicating that this is something that is really valuable to me. Um, so, like, you did service that's awesome wasn't part of it, but I think it was part of the larger picture of who I am as a scholar. Um, I'll add that one of the things I was advised when I was preparing my job application packets was to think about what platform are you presenting yourself on? When you're applying, it's not just here's me and here's 5,000 things I do. It's here's me and here are the reasons why I chose to do these 5,000 things. I had, um, I was a GSA vice president of communications for two years at some point. I did um, funding fellow work with the grad div, a lot of work with graduate students and my department here doesn't have grad students. So when I packaged myself, I said, well, I'm really interested in service learning service learning is my jam. That's what I'm gonna do. And when I came to interviews, a lot of the, the questions that came up about, you know, what I was gonna do in terms of service on the job, I say, eventually I plan to, I still haven't, but I still plan to engage in these university level service learning conversations. And so if that's something that is on the mission statement of the university, for example, and it was here, that's something that they thought was really important. 
Um, and I also want to reinforce kind of Hannah's point about um, you know using your service to explain how you're able to serve diverse populations because it is important as as a, a faculty of color. Sometimes it feels as if though a lot of the person of color service commitments are fed to us first, and we want to do them because we want to be there and represent for the students of color. Um, but there are so few of us that it really does take all of us serving students of color and uh, students that are of marginalized backgrounds um, to really make a, make a change. And so if you have that in your service record, why not emphasize it? We need you, so please join. <laughs> Hi, thank you all for being here. Um, earlier in a panel, uh, someone was discussing how to sort of sell yourself, or that sounds negative, but how to present yourself not as a graduate student, but as a potential faculty member. And I'm wondering how you all did that, particularly when you're still ABD and you know don't have that degree in hand yet. I can give you like some kind of check boxes. Um, so one thing I had to really practice, like especially in my job talk and then just talking about my research, to take ownership. I studied this, my results indicated this, versus our and we, because then, then it looks like your advisor and you. And some of my projects was solely me, and some were my research team, and some was my advisor and I, but I completely positioned it as in this is my research, this is my research agenda, this is what I want to do. And so, and it did, it, I'm, I'm used to going to conference like, you know, my, you know, my colleagues and I and things like that, but you kind of want to pull back from that. I've attended job talks here in my department where I've seen candidates talk about their advisor nonstop and I think they're done, they're done because the whole department sees you as a grad student, not a young professional. Um, especially if you have, like my advisor is known in our field. So the committees know her, like we're good. You don't need to hear about her, you know her. Um, and you need to know that I'm not, I am a separate person from her and I can hold my own. And so I didn't mention my advisor in my job talks. I didn't mention my advisor in my, in my materials besides that she is a person who's gonna write one of the recommendation letters. I had to really distance myself and she even said so. You know, your research is your own and I've mentored you, but I don't go with you. So you cannot bring me with you. And so I had to train myself to really take ownership of how I present my body of work and who I am. And that was, and it was a practice because you're used to saying, we discovered this and we tested for this, not anymore because you're no longer a grad student. Along similar lines with like the language that you use um, is, and this is a process uh, for sure, but um, when you're applying for jobs, especially ABD, it can feel like you're begging for something from other people, but just like every other evaluative situation, you need to say, here's why I'm awesome and what I have to offer you instead of like, I would be so grateful if you do this thing for me, um, because they're not looking for someone to do things for, they're looking for someone to do things for them. Um, and so if you are not already familiar with this resource, um, there's a website, book, blog, Facebook page, et cetera, called The Professor Is In. Um, Karen Kelsky is a, uh, she does consultations on job materials and um, a lot of it is expensive as far as I have heard, well worth it. But if, even if you don't have the money for the paid services, just reading the blog um, really helped me in changing my language in terms of, you know, I'm super excited about this. Like anyone can say they're excited. You like, you have to show your work. <laughs> I'm really interested in this. Anyone can say they're interested. You have to show your work um, and point to concrete examples of the ways in which you've already done this or exemplify this and so on. Um, and in addition to being like, it's a, it's a power related issue, this language. And so it's also a super gendered thing. Um, and so she offers great advice um, on how to present yourself in a, from a position of more power um, that I think is really important in presenting yourself as a um, scholar and not a grad student. That's also the feedback I've gotten from the places where I ended up not going Mm -hmm. They said they chose me because my materials uh, had a, a dignified quality to them. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the hiring member committees actually said, 
your materials read as if though you didn't care whether Northwestern hired you or not. You could teach as well here as you could in East LA College and you wouldn't care because you're the best and you think we need you. So that was a really good point. And if I could just, the, the professor's in, if you, it's a free blog. You can follow them on Instagram and Facebook. It's just another resource. One thing I learned from the professor's in, which is interesting, Molly, is that when you go on the job talk, when you go on the job interview, pack snacks. And I was like, why? Because you, you're 12 hours on and you get so hungry and you're sweaty and you smell and you just need a granola bar. And so I got that from the professor's blog when I got ready to go my fir my first job talk. I was like, I need more resources. And so I just started reading a blog. And one thing was, here are 10 things to do when you have your first job talk. And so I read them. No, and like, seriously. Keep yeah. a granola bar in your bag. Yeah. The number of times you, like, shove food in your face in a bathroom stall um, during an interview is remarkable. In the bathroom cause... stall, Hershey Kisses. Like, I was like, I'm just so tired. And I had to keep... <laughs> Because the breakfast, lunch, and dinner are still interviews. And you know what you can't do at breakfast? Have a hash brown out your face where they're like, oh, hire me. And so you don't eat. And they all say, well, let's take a few bites, and then you pick up a fork. But why, why do you want to come here? I'm like, well, I, I, I don't know yet. <laughs> and so, yeah, every job interview, I went in. I was like, can I just go pee for a second? And then I sat in there. I also used the bathroom. But now I was just like, what's in here? Like, I'm going to die. Because it, it's an 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. day <laughs> until you get back on the flight. And so it was one, one of the many, many things I learned from that blog. God bless that woman, because she is really, like, she is making it a lot easier for us to navigate this space. Yeah, like. Uh, in. in, I-N. Like in office hours, like the professor's in. Yeah. So w blog, website. She sells books and consultation. I never, I don't have any money yet. I'll, I'll have a grown-up <laughs> job soon, though. But the blog itself, and she has guest posts. It's, it's a really great resource. Yeah, and on the interview thing, like, if someone offers you Coffee, say yes. If someone says like, would you like to go to the bathroom? Say yes. Like any time that you can have a break or like take, take a break, take it. Um, or if you're going between things, say, I need to go to the bathroom. Can I go to the bathroom? I think that was something that I saw online is that yeah. like, if you need to make sure you ask, because otherwise they, they, they won't they'll just pass you from person to person to person and never let you like pee. <laughs> LSU gave me a gift bag when they paid me from the airport, and the gift bag had a bunch of LSU swag because they loved themselves, but in there was food, and I didn't get it, and the, the bag was empty when I got back on the plane because I was just like, I am so interested in this job, and then like trying to sneak food in my mouth because I was, I almost fell asleep in my Dean interview because I hadn't eaten for like nine hours, and he was like, David, we like you, and I was like, me too, uh, me too. It's, we can talk about the, the, what it's like to be on a on campus interview, but it is... Hence why I don't want to leave again. It's the worst. Or like when you when you order at restaurants, order things that you can eat with a knife and fork because like eating with your hands is uh, for one thing looks less professional and you want to look like an adult. Um, but also it's just harder. So like think about like even when you're ordering from the menu, like how do I order something that will be easy for me to eat? And if they offer you coffee, say yes and ask for tea. Otherwise, you'll be. <laughs> I wonder if you four could talk about the interview process in terms of, did you ever have to teach a class? Did you ever have to give a formal presentation? So other things so people have a sense of what things may be asked of you that may not be what comes to mind? So my understanding, um, and you know, take this with a grain of salt, because I apply to all teaching relevant positions, primarily liberal arts type schools. Um, but when someone asks for a research job talk, there's a pretty standard formula that they're expected to follow. Um, the amount of time might vary slightly, but it's there's a pretty standard formula. Um, of all of the interviews I had, not one of my teaching demos or talks was the same. Every single one was different. Um, sometimes it was front of a real class that they just like, here, this is social psych and teach a lecture um, on whatever it is that's interesting to you. And sometimes it was, here's the topic for the day, give that talk. Uh, sometimes it was do a teaching demo, but to faculty members, just pretend like they're undergrads. Um, so every single one of my teaching presentations was different. Some were 20 minutes, some were 40 minutes, some were on my research, some were on any topic relevant to that class. 
um, at U of T, they told me 20 minutes on attitudes, 20 minutes on ANOVA, because I was hired to teach stats. Um, so they are, there is not <laughs> a uh, like easy answer to that. Um, they were all very different. Um, my advice along those lines is there are like, always ask questions about who the audience is gonna be, are there actually going to be students? What does the classroom look like? Are you going to have presenter view uh, with your slides on the computer? Um, on one job talk, one interview, I was told I would have presenter view and I didn't. So I just winged my hour long lecture uh, with no notes because I thought I would have my notes. Um, so uh, there was not a nice consistent um, thread for those. Um. I, I would say that I had to do, at every school that I went to, I had to do a research talk at uh, three out of four liberal arts, well, teaching positions. I did apply, I did do an interview at one research university. Um, at three out of four of them, I had to do a, a teaching demo. Um, yeah, you, everyone was different. Um, one of them was, do a teaching demo in 20 minutes to these kids. And it's like, what, what can I teach in 20 minutes to art students? I don't really understand what your class is. It, that one did not go well. Um, <laughs> but the, the computer science teaching demos that I did, one was, this is what the topic is for today. This is what would be covered. Here are our, like, um, it was like a flipped classroom. So here's the readings that the students are going to be doing. Here's the lab that they should be working on, teach. Um, another one was um, they're, doing, they're doing their final projects right now. Uh, talk about your research and teach your research to the class. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, my, my, my research talks I felt like I was constantly changing them, trying to make it better, and never actually getting it in any way that was tolerable. Because um, <laughs> it was like, I, you know, there were three that I went way over. So then I was like, OK, I need to cut back slides. And then like the next one, I was 15 minutes short. And I was just like, I don't know how to do this talk and pace it in a way that actually works. But you know, I think that. You know, as long as you are there and you present yourself well and you own it, it doesn't matter. I, I had to do a job talk and a teaching demo at every institution um, across all three types. I didn't apply to any uh, CCs. Um, and I used the same in all of them. It was just the difference. So, like, my first job talk was 60 minutes and the other three were 45. So I took out one of my four studies. I just took that out, kept the same narrative, just took it out. And my first teaching demo was, this is a strategic communication class. We want something that speaks to you and who you are. So I created a lecture based off of what they were doing. And then the other three happened to be, do whatever you want. So I was like, well, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. And so I kept <laughs> that exact same lecture and just tailored it to how much time I had. Um, but I think Molly might have mentioned this. When you get invited for an on-campus interview, they will give you all of the information, and then you should absolutely ask for more. What does the room look like? How many students are going to be there? Are they going to be undergrad students? Because um, in all of mine, they were classes, classes that were already in session, but the hiring committee sat in the back row. And so they gave me the information first, and I just kind of went from there. And then I asked more questions. Like, I brought my dongle and my own laptop and my own slides. I emailed them to myself as a backup. Um, like you would do for a conference, you want to be overly prepared with your materials in case something will go wrong. Some, in case something goes wrong, because it will. All right. I would like to thank you all so much for this talk, and please give them some applause. This was great. <laughs>